Hi class, today we're going to talk about the Jacobian, which relates to how fast the motors of a robot move to how fast the end effector moves. I like this video because it demonstrates robot singularities. It shows various examples of the three types of singularities that can occur with a six-axis robot. And then for each example, it first shows the robot at the singularity position, and then shows the robot trying to move at a constant velocity on a straight line path that intersects the singularity. So these first videos are showing wrist singularities. These happen when two of the robot's wrist axes, that's joint four and six, line up with each other. This can cause these joints to try and spin 100 degrees instantaneously. So one moves one direction, the other moves the other direction, and the end effector doesn't move uh, in the example. And then when we show it trying to move along a straight line, you see it comes right to that point, and then it has to instantaneously flip those joints in order to get past that singularity. So singularity is a single position, and as we move through that singularity, we have problems. The second example is what's called a wrist singularity. It shows a robot trying and failing to follow a straight line at a constant velocity. The next ones that we see are shoulder singularities. These happen when the center of the robot's wrist aligns with the axes of joint one. It causes joints one and four to try and spin 180 degrees instantaneously. A subset of these is an alignment singularity, where the first and the last joints of the robot here, that's joints one and six, they line up with each other. Now you can see what's causing this failure. There's a singularity right in the middle of that line. You can solve this problem in a couple of ways, but first it's important to understand what's happening. And these finally ones are called elbow singularities. These happen when the center of the robot's wrist lies in the same plane as joints two and three. These elbow singularities look like the robot has reached a little too far, causing that elbow to lock in position. This next video also has something to do with the Jacobian. This is a, a ride that you can ride in an amusement park. It's often called the Scrambler, and it has a bunch of these cars that are rotating around an axis in the center, <laughs> And then these arms stick out the side, and there's a second axis that your car is spinning around. So as you're spinning around, there's two rotational joints. And when I see a ride like this, I want to know, well, where is the ride moving the fastest? And what is the current and instantaneous rotation velocity, angular velocity, and, and also linear velocity for a rider as they're riding this ride? And at the end of today's lecture, we're going to have the math so that we can figure that out. So the next time you're on a scrambler, you can impress your date by instantaneously you know, computing these velocities. So here's a top-down view of that scrambler ride. And we want to know what is that angular and linear velocity right here on the end of this car. And so we've got two rotational joints, and so we would represent the current configuration of the person at this car when we first have our Q1, which is our theta1 angle around the first axis, and Q2, which is our angle from this x-axis to that next axis. So our configuration would be Q1, Q2, and our state would be Q1, Q2, and then the derivative, the time derivative of Q1 and Q2. And so for this, we're going to need a little bit of math. And so I'm going to switch over to my paper here. So we have eta equals the Jacobian, which is a function of our state q times how fast our state variables q are changing, the time derivative here. So for this case, we've got an axis right here, this and my angle around this axis, that's q1. My angle around this axis is q2. And so my two state variables, q is in, it's got q1, q2, and then these ones are in r2. And we've got q1 dot and q2 dot. Not quite true. These are actually both in s1. s1. And the output variables, the velocities that I'm feeling here, you know, if I've got my person who's right here, uh, they're going to feel both a linear velocity, v, and an angular velocity, omega. And this angular velocity, you know, this is 
omega velocity two. If we want to refer this uh, to our base frame, then we say omega two and zero, and our velocity of you know, this point two in the zeroth frame. Now, one of the tricks that we're going to look at is that we can actually decompose this Jacobian into two rows. The first row, which deals with the velocity, and the second row, which deals with the angular velocity. And so we'll just call those J subscript of Q and J omega of Q. Again, they're functions of Q because it, when we get into a different configuration, the same motor speeds will not have the same velocity effects on my rider who's right here. We can actually calculate this directly out. As I move Q1 dot, the velocity that I have here is really determined by how long is this moment arm. This moment arm that comes out here, so this is R1, and then this axis right here is R2. And so my Q1 is going to affect my X velocity. So I'm gonna have, this is my X velocity, my VY velocity, my VZ velocity, and then I'm going to have my omega X, omega Y, and omega Z. And so you know, I'm gonna show you these answers, how it comes out. So Q1 dot is going to affect how long, how far I'm stretched out in the X direction. So if you remember your forward kinematics, that's gonna be the sign of this angle. So the total distance here is negative one, negative R1, S1, minus R2, S of one plus two, because it's a, the two angles together. Give me what angle this moment arm is. And then my Q2 dot is going to be multiplied negative R2 sine of one plus two. My motor two is only affecting this moment arm, whereas my moment my motor one is affecting the combination of both moment arms together. And then the Y is going to be just the cosines of those. So that's R1, C1 plus R2, C1, two. And this is R2, C1, two. Now, neither of these motors is going to make any difference at all for my velocity in the Z plane. Everything here is in the plane, so there's nothing coming out of the plane. And so that means I'm going to have zero here and zero here. And that's this top part. This is my, velo you know, my linear velocity Jacobian. And now my angular velocity Jacobian says, how does Q1, Q2 affect my velocity about the world X, Y, and Z axes? And so you notice as I spin these, these are both spinning about, this is Z zero. This axis here is Z one one. So there is no rotation, no roll, no pitch. So I get nothing for these ones, nothing for these ones. Q1 is going to linearly affect my angular velocity. So the answer here is just going to be one. And the answer here is going to be one. So we can build that out. So now it is time to review some of our rotation definitions. Remember, if we're given a rotation matrix, we know that is an SO3. So it's a special orthogonal of dimension three. Uh, if we're only gonna do two axes, then that'd be SO2. And we had three different ways that we could represent that. And I've got three different illustrations here. So this first illustration that I have here is showing that um, this matrix R could just be telling us, how do we get from the red frame? Or how do we refer to some point P? This point P actually exists. And if we want to be able to relate its coordinates in two different coordinate frames, if I've got P in my red frame, then I multiply it by this R, which corresponds to the blue frame, and I can tell about what are its coordinates in this blue frame. The other thing that we can do is we can talk about what is the orientation of the transform coordinate frame with respect to a fixed coordinate frame. And so we said, you know, I want to know where R1 is according to the z -width frame. And so this R1 is an X and a Y and a Z axis. We want to know what direction they're pointed according to some other frame. So then this is R1 and zero. And the final one is that we can use this as an operator that if I have a vector and I want to rotate it, so I have this green vector and I want to rotate that vector and I want to know where is that vector now in the base frame. Well, I can apply this R matrix to it and it tells me where it is. So we can talk about you know the same thing in two different frames. We can talk about how to get one frame to another and we can talk about rotating an axis. So now it's time for a little bit of review because we need this information. So let's say that we've got at some time time t, or we're at a certain rotation matrix r, and this can be time varying, and we would like to know, you know what is its instantaneous derivative of r. And in order to know the derivative of r, how it's changing in time, we have to know what is the current axis you're spinning around. We call this axis that we're spinning around omega, and again, this could be time varying. So time t, we are at a current rotation r, and we're spinning around some axis omega. Well then, this time derivative of r of t is equal to s 
of omega t. So this S is some skew symmetric matrix, which is totally defined by the three numbers that define this axis, multiplied by our current rotation matrix t. And so this S, it was a skew symmetric matrix. We say that S is in lowercase so3. It's skew symmetric. That means that S transpose plus S is equal to zero. So we say S is equal to lowercase uh, skew symmetric SO3. And SO3 had four wonderful properties. The first is that it's linear. So if I have some scalar alpha and beta that are in the real numbers, and then my vectors A and B, which are three vectors, and if my rotation is a rot special orthogonal matrix of order three, well then this has the property of linearity, which means I can pull out this alpha out here. So I can say alpha uh, skew symmetric of bold A plus beta of skew symmetric B uh, it is linear so these add together the other very cool property is that the skew symmetric it, it is defined as a cross product so if I'm rotating around some alpha and multiplied by some vector B well, it's the same thing as just a cross B the next one we have is a similarity transform. You know, I want to rotate around some matrix alpha that is in some other rotation matrix. Well, I could first switch over into that rotated coordinate frame, then I could apply my skew symmetric, and then I could switch out. Or what I could do is I could just rotate that alpha. I could just bring that R inside here, and rotate about that. And the final thing is showing that you know, this projection um, on itself of a vector is going to give zero. You can think about it because S of B times A, so the skew symmetric of B times A, well, that is a cross product. You know, this is equal to A transpose times B cross A. And so this is perpendicular to both B and A. And so if you dot product with itself, it's going to have nothing. Uh, next, we need to come up with a definition of you know, how do we find our, our skew symmetric matrix omega i. So we're going to assume that this vector omega is time bearing. So it's got the t in there. And we're going to refer to omega as a free vector. Yeah. And so it can be anywhere, anywhere in space. You know, we can be rotating about anything. We don't care where it's based at. We just care what direction it's pointing. Now, if I have some rotation matrix where it's time derivative it's telling about where is j in frame i and if that has angular velocity that it's rotating around some uh, vector i uh, in frame j we say that omega is a free vector so what we need to know is what coordinate frame are we referring to somebody just hands you an omega, you need to know what, what is the coordinate frame that it's in. And so the definition that we're going to use in this class, we're going to say that omega ij in frame k is angular velocity of the time derivative of r of j in frame i, time derivative dot here, in frame k. And so remember, a frame k means that you know I've got some origin k, got an x of k, I've got a y of k, and I've got a z of k. So